Hi guys, in an earlier video after hooking up my ARM homebrew computer to ROM and an LCD I uh, made it render a Mandelbrot set and I thought it might be interesting for you guys if I talk through how some of the code works. It's not something I've done a lot of on this channel so please let me know if you like this or not um, or if you want more depth or less depth that would be really interesting to hear as feedback so let me know in the comments. So let's start by looking at the original test program I showed and this is the one which just cleared the LCD screen and drew a yellow rectangle on it. And this is all built using GNU Assembler and a little make file I built to uh, kind of assemble it and sort out programming the ROMs, splitting things into the different parts of the ROMs. I think I showed that before in another video. So first I'm declaring that what gets assembled should go into the text segment. That doesn't actually matter much because I think that's the default anyway. In ARM, execution starts at the very first address in memory. Uh, that's the, that is the reset vector, is, is at address zero. Normally that would contain a jump instruction to the actual start of the code, but for now I'm just writing my program starting at address zero, uh, and that'll work fine. So the first thing this program does is it does a branch and link to this LCD initialization routine, which I'll explain in a second. After doing that, we draw our rectangle. And the way we do that is we set up the coordinates of the edges of the rectangle in four registers, R0 through R3. And then we load a color value into register 4. All these registers are 32-bit. Uh, the color value is actually only 16-bit here. I don't know why I picked minus 256, but it, it kind of generates a yellow shade as shown in the comment there. And with those registers loaded, we do a branch and link to this fill rectangle routine. And once that's done, we just have an infinite loop. And finally, at the very end of this program, I'm including uh, another source file, which is the glcd source file. And this contains the initialization and fill rectangle routines that are referenced above. I'm not doing any proper cross-file linking here. I'm just including entire source files inside each other just for simplicity. So let's have a look at the LCD library file now, uh, which contains those initialization routines. And you see at the top of the LCD initialization file, we have this big block of initialization data. The format of this data is that each two byte half word represents one byte of information to send to the LCD and the high byte of the half word indicates whether it's a command byte or a data byte. If the high byte is zero, it's a command byte and if the high byte is one, it's a data byte. So on this first line, you can see that we're sending command F9 and then we're sending data zero and then data eight. Next line down is command C0, then data one nine, then data one A. Generally, I've put one command per line here. Uh, there's a couple of exceptions a bit further down the table where there are too many data entries to fit comfortably on one line. Finally, down here at the end of the table, there's a half word with a high byte set to FF. And this is a sentinel that marks the end of the initialization data so that the loop in GLCD init knows when to stop. After all that initialization data, I've put an align directive. This is because all ARM code needs to be four byte aligned. And the argument to the align directive in this uh, assembler is a power of two. So this indicates that the assembler should align the next instruction on, a, on, on the second power of two, which is four. And I think that four byte alignment uh, constraint applies to all ARM32 code. Um, the exception comes with the thumb instruction set, which is only two bytes aligned. But this, the, but this processor doesn't support that. That was a much later development. Uh, next up, this EQU instruction is a directive to the assembler that the uh, variable GLCD MMIO should be considered to equal the value that I've given here. Uh, this is very similar in the uh, 6502 assemblers to writing GLCD MMIO equals OX3 O whatever. Um, it's just done differently in GNU assembler. You can't write it in that syntax. You have to write it in this syntax instead. And what this represents is the base address for uh, memory mapped I.O. for the GL for the graphical LCD display. So the address I've given there is actually the 24-bit address with the top two bits set. Next we have the uh, GLCD init routine itself. Uh, this is the first routine that the example program was calling, which is what sort of sets up the LCD, puts its registers in a good state, and, and turns on the display. So the first thing it's doing is it's uh, storing the value of GLCD MMIO in register 12. And the reason we do this is that in the ARM instruction set, you can't write to a constant uh, 
immediate address in the same way that you can with the 6502. So when we want to store data to the uh, MMIO address for the LCD, we can't do that with an explicit address in the instruction. We have to have that address stored in a register, and then the uh, and then the store instruction will store relative to that register. And I'm going to use register 12 for this throughout the program. I'm going to load it with this value and never change that. Next up we have an ADR instruction. This is not really an ARM instruction. This is a directive to the assembler that it should emit instructions to get the value of GLCD init data into R0. On the face of it, we could have used a MOV instruction like we did with uh, GLCD MMIO. And that would actually have worked in this case, but the ADR instruction is more traditional and flexible for this. So what's the difference there? Well, the MOV instruction can only load immediate values which can be represented as an 8-bit constant uh, with, I think it has to be an even-numbered rotate. Um, so you can load arbitrarily large values, but they must only have 8 bits set in a row in general. So this works for GLCD MMIO because it only has 2 bits set in a row. I think the assembler here would load the number 3 with a with an 8-bit rotate write or something like that for the LCD MMIO value. But if I had a more interesting number for that value, then it wouldn't work as a MOV instruction. And the thing about GLCD init data is I don't actually know what number that's going to be because that just depends on what address in memory it ends up being. Um, so generally loading an absolute address into a register isn't something that you can just do with a single instruction like that. You have to you have to be a bit more creative. And the general technique here is to uh, load the value as an offset from the current program counter. And that's exactly what the ADR instruction does. It doesn't, it, as I said, it's not an actual ARM instruction. It instructs the assembler to output an add or a sub instruction, I believe, uh, to add or subtract a constant value to the program counter and store the result of that in whichever register you say. So in this case, because GLCD init data is earlier in memory than the current instruction, it's going to emit a subtract instruction to subtract some value from uh, from, from register 15 uh, and store the result in register 0. Next up we have a numeric label. Um, these numeric labels in GNU Assembler are a little bit special, and I'll say a little bit more about them in a sec when we get to the branch instruction that branches back to it. But this marks the start of the loop, looping through the initialization data that we just looked at. So within the loop, we have two LDRB instructions. LDR means load register, and the B suffix means it is a byte memory operation. Remember that byte versus word pin on the CPU, that's what this kind of controls. And remember that in word mode, these load instructions only work for word aligned addresses, and these addresses we're using here are not word aligned, so we, need, we definitely need to be in byte mode for this. So the first instruction here is loading register 1 with uh, the value stored at whatever address is in register 0. Uh, the square brackets kind of mean this is where the address is. And outside the square brackets we have this number 1, and this is called a post increment. And this means that after doing the load, the ARM CPU will increment register 0 by 1. So you don't need a separate add instruction for that. And the next instruction downloads register 2 in exactly the same way, uh, increment, incrementing R0 one more time. So now R0 has been incremented by 2 bytes, and we've read an entire half word out of the initialization data. We compare register 2 against hex FF. Uh, remember, this is the sentinel that marks the end of the initialization data. And the compare instruction will always set the flags. And in particular, it's going to set the equal flag uh, to either on or off. Next up, we have a more complex instruction. And this is the store instruction. It's str, meaning store register. Then it has an ne suffix, which means not equal. And that means this will only execute if the equal flag is not set. And then it has a B suffix as well, meaning it's only going to store a single byte. So you can read this as store a byte if not equal, for example. And the not equal thing is an example of ARM's conditional execution. All instructions uh, can be executed conditionally just by putting these kinds of suffixes after them, as opposed to just branch instructions, which is kind of more traditional. The arguments to the store instruction are to store uh, the value from register 1, and again, we have square brackets around the address it's going to get stored into. So that address means R12 plus R2 with a left shift of 8. LSL means logical shift left. And the shift only applies to the second argument within the brackets, that is R2. 
So this means that we multiply R2 by 256 and add it to R12. And all of that happens inside a single uh, cycle inside the ARM processor. As long as the shift argument here is a constant rather than coming from a register, the offset and the shift both cost nothing more than what it would cost without them. Remember that register 2 is the high byte of the 16-bit half word, which was a data versus command indicator, and it was 0 for data, sorry, it was 0 for commands and 1 for data. If that was set to 1, then rather than storing at the address in R12, we store at 256 greater than the address in R12. And that just means we end up setting the CPU's address 8 bit, and that's the one that I've wired through to the LCD's data versus command input. This form of the store instruction does not modify the value stored in R12. There is a, um, a symbol you can add to this, which would mean that R12 then gets 256 added to it as well. Um, kind of a bit like the post increment that we saw before. It would be called a pre increment in that case, but I haven't set that flag here. So the value stored in R12 doesn't get modified here. Next up, we have a branch not equal instruction back to label one. And notice that the label reference here has a B suffix on it. So the way these numeric labels work in GNU Assembler, they're used for kind of temporary local labels where you don't really want to give everything a name. Um, you definitely don't want these to be published as symbols that other uh, files can link to and, and, and all of that jazz. Um, these are just throwaway things that are meant to be really easy to throw in and use. And basically what happens when you reference one of these labels is you give the number of the label and then you put either a B or an F. And if you put a B, it goes back to the most recent occurrence of that label backwards, and if you put an F, it goes forward to the next occurrence of that label forwards. So this means branch to one backwards, essentially. And it's a branch of not equal. So looking back at that comparison instruction, if the, if the value in register 2 was hex FF, then the store would not occur because uh, the equal bit would have been set and the NE uh, condition codes would mean that the store doesn't occur. And then this branch would also not occur because, again, it has the NE suffix. On the other hand, if R2 had any value other than hex FF, then both the store and the branch would execute. So next I've put a comment in here saying that the last command in the init data was an exit sleep mode. Um, and according to the datasheet, we should wait for 120 milliseconds before continuing. I've hard-coded this for a CPU clock speed of 150 hertz because that's what I was using at the time I wrote the code. The first instruction here is a load register instruction to load a value into register 0. Normally load register loads from memory, but what I'm using here is a special form of the instruction which again turns it into a kind of a directive for the assembler telling it to do something a little bit more fancy than just emitting the instruction. Um, and the way this works is you specify an immediate value, in this case I've got some calculation involving FREC, and the assembler will kind of calculate what that value is, and then, and then it will emit an instruction here to get that value into register 0. If the value it generates can be expressed in a form that the uh, MOV instruction could load, remember we saw that before, that there's a restriction on what kind of immediate values you can load with a MOV instruction. So if this immediate value is of the form that can be expressed that way, then this will just emit a MOV instruction. If it can't be represented that way, then what the assembler will do is it will arrange for the value that it needs to load to be stored somewhere else in memory, either earlier or later in the program. And in this location, it will emit a load instruction, which loads register zero with the value stored in that memory address. And it does that using a uh, offset from the program counter again, a bit like the ADR instruction, except instead of loading the address of something, we're loading uh, a specific value. And next we have the small de delay loop. Um, register zero has now been loaded with the uh, number of times to loop. So we have label two here. We're subtracting one from register zero. Uh, the way these uh, maths instructions work, the first register named is the destination register. And then the other arguments are the values to add. The first of which has to be a register and the last of which can be a register or a constant. So this just says store in register zero the value of register 0 minus 1. And notice that I added the s suffix to the sub instruction here, and that means that the sub instruction will set the flags based on the result of the subtraction. On the ARM processor, setting the flags is almost always optional, and when you want it to happen, you put an s after the instruction. So after subtracting 1 from register 0, things like the 0 flag will get set, and the negative flag and all of that jazz. 
and again we have a branch of not equal here so if the if the if the result of that subtraction was zero then we will stop branching back to label two Next up, I'm sending an explicit command to turn on the display. Um, this is not part of the initialization data because I wanted to get this uh, delay loop in there in the middle. So we're loading the value hex 29 into register one. Um, that is a eight bit constant, so that's fine to do in a mov instruction. It doesn't even need any shifts to do that. And then we're just storing that byte from register one into the address at register 12, which is the uh, LCD's command port. And finally after that we're moving the value from the link register into the program counter and this is the standard way of returning from subroutines. Um, remember that a subroutine call is a branch and link which means that the link register gets initialized with the kind of continuation address um, before the branch happens and this instruction here kind of mirrors that by copying the link register into the program counter so that execution will resume from that address. So that's it for this video. I went into quite some depth in uh, this first bit of initialization code for the LCD because it is the first bit of ARM code we're talking about and I'm kind of assuming that you guys are coming from a background of not knowing any ARM code here. I'll probably make at least one other video uh, following up on this and going through the Mandelbrot plotting code and maybe the rest of the LCD uh, management code as well. We'll see about that. Again, as I said at the start of the video, let me know in the comments if you like this, if you think there's too much depth or not enough depth, I'd love to hear and I can adjust how much I discuss. That's it for this video though, hope you liked it and see you next time.